You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott Hambrick. There's Matt Reynolds over there. I can see him, but you can't. I was going to say you said over there. <laughs> yeah. And over here is Milton. I'm petting Milton the cat. That's right. You're petting your cat. Yeah. Like a Bond villain. So what are we going to talk about today? Oh, how strong is strong enough? Okay. Or maintenance is a myth. We don't know yet. Yeah, we were talking about this. Well, a lot of people won't understand the relationship there, but there is, you and I see it for sure. It's the same thing. Asking the question, how strong is strong enough? And then understanding that maintenance is a myth, they work hand in hand. These things are identical. So how strong is strong enough? Well, most people don't get to pick. I'll never get to pick. My life intervenes with my training and I'm always doing the two step. Yeah. You know, two steps forward, one step back. And sometimes it's one step forward, two steps back. That's right. And I do what I can when I can. And the result is I get a PR a couple times a year. You know, I was looking at my training that's in true coach. At this point, I have about three and a half years of data in there. Yep. And on my squat, I've done about 12 and a half pounds a year. <laughs> right. And, you know, I probably could have done more. And in fact, I think I'm going to do a lot, lot more now, but I had to quit my job to do it. Sure. But life intervenes. So I end up doing the best I can and my results are mediocre. But I don't think that's my fault. And I don't think it's my coach's fault. It's just, you know, at my age and I'm decently strong, that's just what happens. So I don't get to pick. Yeah, age, life, and priority, right? Like, let's not skim over what your life has looked like the last several years, right? Like, how long did you own data storage? 20 years. Decades. This is your job. And not just your job, not your occupation. You weren't working for somebody and punching a time clock. You're running a company with a fair number of employees. And the process of selling that business, and we're close friends, at the end of last year was an extremely stressful process. It is, even though it all worked out well in the end and even... It went well at every step. It went very smooth, right? I mean, you gave up the business that you owned and grew for 20 years. And so your training suffered horrendously in the fourth quarter of 2018. Yep. Yeah. And now that you are uh, retired and that your work life doesn't get in the way as much of your training, all of a sudden you're hitting PRs. Like, it's crazy. You're hitting all-time PRs. I'm stronger than I've ever been. Not a little. Right. Like, a lot stronger than I've ever been. And you're 43, is that right? Yeah, 44. 44. Yeah, last night I hit the bench press single. It's five pounds under my all-time one rep. Yeah. You know, numbers like that. But, you know, like I said, I had to, <laughs> had to sell my business to get there. And you're not ever going to get to choose, right? Like, you're not ever going to say... Hey, let's stop chasing PRs. There will be a day. You're always giving me a hard time that there's a real reality, as much as I don't want to talk about it, that I have peaked in strength and that I'm never going to hit another PR. Not a reality, there's a vast probability that I'm never going to hit another PR. And so I will still chase PRs. I'll chase post 40 PRs. Right. All right. So, man, most of my PRs came from 30 to 35, 30 to 34. And as a competitive lifter, and I probably will now start chasing PRs of post 40 masters PRs for me. And then the day will come when I'll chase post 50 PRs. And, you know, old guys don't get to choose. You started late enough that you at 44 will be able to probably keep hitting PRs for a couple more years. And then you will have peaked. Yep. And then you won't be able to hit PRs anymore. And you're not going to get to decide how strong is strong enough. It doesn't mean that. And that's why we say maintenance is a myth. At no point, I know you'll never email me and say, hey, let's just maintain, like long-term, right? Like there's times when people are, you're going through a life cycle where you're selling your business and you're like, hey, I'm just doing the best we can to stave off detraining and death. But long-term, we don't really ever get to a point that we just say, hey, we're strong enough and so let's just uh, maintain for the rest of our lives. You just can't. And it's not about like, oh, we don't decide to do that. I have clients ask me all the time, like, hey, uh, pretty strong now. You know, like maybe they've got a 375 for five squat and it's a 40 year old guy. That's pretty darn good for a 40 year old dude that hasn't been weight training his whole life. He's like, I'd just like to be able to just kind of keep it like a 315 squat now. Well, you really can't do that. That's right. You know, if you squat 315 for three sets of five, three days a week, about two and a half weeks in, that's going to be really hard 
That's right. And you'll start missing that last rep that next to the last. So we have to kind of undulate about a point. Yep. So if you want to squat 315 on demand, the truth of it is you need to be able to squat about 335 <laughs> at any given time sure. so that you can squat 315 whenever you want. Well, and if your life is so uh, vanilla and so boring that you actually get to choose that I just want to maintain my squat at 315 for three sets of five for the rest of my life. One, I just think it's unrealistic. I just think in today's world, it just doesn't happen, right? Because that guy's at some point is going to get sick. Probably not sick with cancer, although maybe sick with cancer. But I mean, I'm just talking about his allergies are going to turn into a sinus infection that's going to turn into an upper respiratory infection. He's going to take antibiotics for 10 days and he's going to lose 10% of his strength. And he's going to have to work back up to 315, 335, 350. We're always pursuing strength. And then you get a little older and you go through a period where, you know, we just moved our house and we moved. You sold your business. I didn't have a gym. Yep. I've owned a gym for years. And for a period of several weeks, I didn't own a gym because the old one was torn down and the new one wasn't built yet. As a matter of fact, it's still not built. As I record right now, there are guys back in my gym putting it together. And my goal is to do my first training session in a while this afternoon. And so you don't get to choose. Your kids get married. You go to their wedding. You go on vacation. We go to Cancun for seven days. It's awesome. You, you know, then you have grandkids and you watch your grandkids. Sybil, who's 83, she's about to miss two weeks of training because one of her kiddos is going through some medical stuff right now and she's going to take care of her kids. She's not going to be able to train yep. because she's going to take care of, of a kiddo. And so when she comes back, she's going to be weak, weak for her. I got a couple of stories. My father-in-law, Todd, training partner, friend. He's 54, I think, and he's been pulling singles in the 400s. Strong dude. Earlier this year, he had a painful tooth, and they went in and worked on it, and he got an abscess. Right. I mean, it got nasty, and they ended up having to cut him, give an incision around his jawline, and put a drain in Oof. from the outside. I mean, it was abscessed. Right. Of course, we have careful training logs. I watch every rep that he does, and he's a super conscientious, hardworking guy, and he lost 25% off of all of his lifts over a bad tooth right he's old enough now man i don't want to jinx him or anything like that but damn it might be labor day before he gets back sniffing those old numbers sure. and that tooth thing happened to him in early april so it's a two-month setback at least right right yeah sometimes it's a lot more maybe more it might take him six months to get that last 25 percent back that's as long as everything goes fine for the next three and a half weeks right right like he could also get sick yeah, he could get allergies. He could because it's the last twenty five percent. It's not the middle or the first twenty five percent. You know that last twenty five percent is hard fought. Yeah, that's right. And the older you get, the harder fought it is. Here's another story. My dad. I was talking to him about this last night. In fact, they're probably out there training right now. He spiked a fever last. I think it was in July, and he was in the hospital for ten days. And his fever would go up to one hundred four, and then they'd read it back down and go back up to one hundred four. And then it was this fever of unexplained origin. Yeah. They never figured out what the heck it was. It finally went away and he lost 75% off of his squat. Man. <laughs> well, he, you know, he's 73 years old. You go in the hospital for 10 days with a fever like that. Every time your fever goes up, it's killing muscle fibers and brain cells and nerve cells. I mean, that stuff's deleterious and it's going to take him a long, long time to get back. Sure. And the thing is, when you're old enough, if you're Sybil's age and it knocks you down that much, you work hard to come back. The truth of it is you might not get mm -hmm. back to your previous where you were before you were in the hospital. That's right. But there's an important thing to understand here. Your dad, even with a really bad illness, had developed a foundation of strength that might have kept him alive those 10 days had he not ever had it. I suspect so. He was squatting in the mid twos for fives. Mm hmm. With the safety squat bar, by the way. And he had trained pretty diligently for a couple years or so before that, right? Yep. And had he not ever done that in the first place, your dad might not be here today. And so there's a foundation of strength that happens. One of the things that's wonderful about strength and hypertrophy both, right? Because as we get older, that sarcopenia becomes a big deal. And we have that muscle loss is that hypertrophy and strength of all of the physical attributes take the longest to gain. Yep. But they also take the longest to lose, right? If your dad, it's hilarious to think about your dad potentially being an endurance athlete, but if your dad was a marathon runner, if Frog was a marathon runner and he had gone for 10 days, I mean, he would have lost 100% of his endurance because that endurance, that cardiorespiratory endurance, that comes and goes quickly. It's fleeting, right? That's why it's so hard that you get in really good shape 
fishing the prowler or doing your CrossFit or whatever you're doing, and then you stop doing it and you go out to Mexico for 10 days and you come back, you're like, oh my God, I'm in terrible shape again. But you don't come back 10 days later and you're really, really weak. Now, you might have a debilitating illness for 10 days and lose a significant amount of strength. But what's important to understand is that that foundation of strength is there. And often it's that foundation. It's that what can you do when you're sick and ill and on your worst day and no sleep? That's really the baseline that we're trying to maintain. That's the maintenance, right? We get these people all the time that on the very first day, they can't squat the empty bar. We see this all the time. All the time. Right? They cannot squat an empty bar. So their foundation of strength is as close to zero as you could possibly get. And one of the things we're doing is we're building resilience. It's that quote, it's that stronger people are harder to kill and are harder to kill because they've got this resilience that have been built up. This level of strength and hypertrophy that protects our body so that when we're hit with the 10 day, 104 degree fever, it doesn't kill us. Yeah. Right. And we're able to come back from that. Yeah. And, you know, and there are all kinds of interruptions in our training and in our lives. You know, it's a continuum between having hay fever <laughs> or going on a vacation all the way up to, you know, IV meds in the ICU for 10 days or whatever that we have to deal with. And so most of us don't get so strong that we don't have one of those kinds of things that interfere with our training and set us back. So when I say that maintenance is a myth, I find that most people will experience some sort of setback that puts them, it's like a time machine. It sets you back months in your uh, training and then we just do it again. Yeah, you're getting better or you're getting worse. Yep. That's what happens, right? You're either not training, so therefore you're actively detraining. You're getting weaker and that might be just a vacation where you're drinking too many margaritas or it might be an illness or just time off of training. Yep. Or we are getting better. We're trying to get back to where we were. We're trying to build on what we currently have. And so this idea of like, well, let's just maintain for the rest of our life. Like it's a myth. It's just impossible because of life. I tell my clients all the time that if you're over 35 in general, if you're over 35, you train as hard as you can all the time. And very soon it becomes a struggle to take weight off the bar as slowly as possible. So we don't get to choose. That's right. And Sully told me once, and I think I mentioned this on the show, that most people who you know, you were a professional athlete and involved in strength sports from an early age and got super, super strong in your mid thirties. You don't count here. Sure. But Sully says for most people, they can hit PRs up until about 55 to 57 years old for men. Sure. I think that's probably true. Like John was still hitting some PRs and that's about how old he is. Yeah. But you know, is he going to be hitting them when he's 67? No. Nope. One, he'll be 67 and that's darn hard. And two, he'll be so damn strong at 58, sure. you know, that I don't know that he can exceed that, you know? Yeah, that's the problem. The guy's got a 600-pound deadlift at whatever age he is now at 57 years old or however old he is. So when he's 67, is he still going to be able to deadlift 600 pounds? Are there any 67-year-old humans who can deadlift 600 pounds? There probably are a couple out there, but not very many. So, I mean, it's just... That's pretty tough. At some point, it starts falling apart. And so then his job is to take weight off the bar as slowly as possible. The same way we use fractional plates to go up, that guy's going to be using fractional plates to go down. So can John ask himself, am I strong enough right now? And I think that he can't. And by God, he might be strong enough, but he has to train like he's not because he's going to get declining results at this point, I think. Sure. No, he's a great guy to use as an example just because he's so strong and he's in that age range that we're talking about. Yeah. The other thing that has to be considered here is that in order to train, there has to be a goal. There has to be a thing that we're pursuing. Yeah, maintenance is not a good goal, is it? Yeah, like I don't even know that it can be a goal. You could say it's a goal. You can verbalize it's a goal, but it's probably not actually a goal. Like, how do you pursue maintenance? For somebody that's older. Sure. You know, they're like, Sybil. Sybil. Hey, you know, if they said, you know, my goal is to match my deadlift from today, next February, that's probably a pretty good goal. You know, that's exactly what Sybil told me. You know, she can deadlift in the 150s for sets now. She's like, boy, if I could deadlift 150 when I'm 90, I'm like, you know, that's a great goal. That's a great goal. And 150 deadlift at 90 years old is for, for anybody, for any human. For an 83-year-old lady to set that goal, it's great. But for the most part, that's not a question. That's, and so, you know, you take a guy, I'd mentioned a guy that I actually had this conversation with was Brett McKay. I mean, Brett has been one of these guys. Brett is in his mid-30s now, so he's at this sort of peak of athletic ability, like again, because it takes so long to build strength. You think about it, like you hit your peak in gymnastics when you're 16 or 17 years old 
and then you start going down. But because strength takes so long to build, you often hit that peak in strength in your late 30s. If you have trained from an early age, if you were one of these people who were generally athletic, you trained some in high school, you probably did it wrong, you trained in college, you probably did it wrong, but you still were already lifting and you were familiar to lifting. And this is kind of in Brett. Brett has lifted barbells since he was in high school, right? Now he's in his mid thirties. And Brett got to the point where he's now one of those guys that he's pushing a 500 pound squat. He's got an over 600 pound deadlift at this point, a 315 bench, a 215, 218, somewhere in their press. And we actually had the conversation. And the reason I had the conversation was not because I needed to know, you know, how strong is strong enough? Brett, are you strong enough? It's because I needed to know what we were training for. What's the goal? Do you want to keep competing in strength lifting meets? And if that's the case, then we're going to keep pushing strength. Or would you like to compete in something else? Like he's talked some about occasionally he doesn't advertise it much. And I don't think he cares that I say this, but like his wife really likes to do mud runs type things. Right. And so those adventure type races. And so he'll do the little short ones with her and have fun. I'm like, Hey, do you want to compete at those? Do you want to, he talked for a while about doing boxing. Like actually like, I'm like, I don't, you know, like I try to steer him away from boxing because I think getting punched in the head thousands and thousands of times, probably not a great idea, but we had to have a goal. And that's when he decided, you know, I actually really enjoy getting strong. We've referenced back to this idea of uh, motivation over discipline. He was motivated to get strong as the primary goal. So he just keeps trying to get strong. Now, here's the deal. Brett may get sick. No, he will. Brett may go on vacation. He's been traveling. He's going to. going to get sick at some point. Like, it might not be, might not be an illness that kills him. But, like, at some point, he's going to get sick. His kids are going to get sick. You know, he's stressed from business. And his strength is going to decline for a period. And that period might be seven days and that period might be seven months and then he's got to start trying to get stronger again yep and so this idea of you ever asking the question you often hear the question from people who are in sort of mid to late lp well how strong is strong am i strong enough well what does that mean i understand what they're asking what they're asking is am i strong enough to handle anything that life would throw at me now that's an okay question mm -hmm. we train we don't exercise. We have to train for a goal. And so for that goal, I know, I know John, that he's still training to be stronger. I know that Brett is still training to be stronger. I know that you're still training to be stronger. And I'm going to go in that gym in about two hours and I'm going to lift. I have no idea what it's going to be. Like I'm probably going to squat 225 and I'm going to press, I don't know, 175 and I'm going to deadlift 315. Yeah. And that's going to be my starting numbers. And then in two days, I'm going back in and I'm going to bump up the weight a little bit. Now I'll be able to bump up the weight a little faster than normal. I'm not taking five pound jumps. I'll probably take 10 to 20 pound jumps and I'll do that. And pretty quick, I'll get back to being generally strong. And then I'm going to keep pursuing. I'm going to still pursue PRs. And by the way, let's talk about it. Cause you keep wanting to talk about it. <laughs> yes. For me in my brain, I still have pipe dreams that I have PRs left to hit. I have come to terms with the fact that I'm never going to hit a bench press PR again. I've torn both pecs bad. I've torn both pecs bad because I've been a competitive lifter for, I mean, a very high, not highest of level, but a high level competitive lifter for 15 years. So I tore both pecs. I have come to terms with the fact that I'm never going to hit a squat PR. My best squat 605. I'm never squatting 600 again. But I do have some pipe dreams that I'm going to press over 300 again, and then I'm going to deadlift over 725. And I think it's possible that I can. Is it probable that I will? But I have a goal that I'm chasing. Yeah. And then I'll try to get back there. Yeah. And so we'll see how it goes. You are stronger than I am, even though you haven't trained in a number of weeks. And let's be frank, even in those weeks coming up to your gym being torn apart and not being able to train, you, you hadn't been killing it either because you've been dealing with other stuff. Right. I mean, so even then you weren't like really nailing it. Sure. Which is fine. And so you're going to do a little bit lighter session today just so you're not stove up with soreness. Correct. And Next week, you will probably move all of my PR numbers for sets Correct. in your training, and that ain't good enough. That ain't good enough for you. Not for me. Nope. It, nope, it's not. You've got to keep going. Yeah, within about four workouts, I'll squat over 400 pounds. I'll bench over 300 pounds. I'll deadlift 545, maybe. Definitely over 500 pounds. And that's okay for other people, but for me, it's not good enough. And I wouldn't be able to lift if it were good enough. Because I wouldn't find any value in it, right? Training brings me value because I'm constantly pursuing a goal. And so if I say, well, all right, I can squat 400 and I can bench 300 and I can deadlift over 500. No, not for me. Honestly, my goal right now is just consistency. Yeah. Starting this afternoon, 
It's not even about the numbers. I know the numbers come. They always have my whole life for over 20 years of training. If I'm consistent, I keep making progress with the rare exception of tearing a pec or something, right? Which can happen. But for me, as long as I'm consistent and I'm injury free, which isn't a guarantee, I'll just keep getting stronger. Yep. What has set me back for 10 straight years of business ownership and family and marriage and having children and moving and all those sorts of things, those things cause a, and I'm not blaming them. Like that's on me. Like it comes down to priorities, right? But at some point you have to choose. I actually don't believe strength training is the most important thing in life. I don't believe it's the most important thing. I think it's super important. I think it's the most general thing that we can do for that voluntary hardship, not to shove that down people's throat. I just think it's general. It works for everybody, right? It does. But my marriage is more important than my squat. And my fatherhood is more important than my squat. And my learning and continuing to learn and, you know, read hard things is as important as my squat and build my business and taking care of my staff and taking care of my clients. That's more important than my squat. To me, it is, right? And some people would listen to that and say, man, your squat should be more important than some of those things. It's not, right? My faith is more important than my squat. Like my faith, faith for some people is non-existent. It's not even on the list. That's okay, right? For me, all of those things are more important than my squat, but my squat is still real important. And so I'm gonna keep chasing that. I can pursue a goal. By the way, it's very hard to set a goal for being a better husband. (laughs) It's very hard to set a goal for being a better father, right? If you're really awful, That's not such a hard goal. (laughs) Sure. But training goals are easy. We can set those and say, here's the pursuit. This is what I'm pursuing. You were talking about these priorities and how your squat's not your biggest priority. I've got a young trainee who's 17 and he's decently strong, but he's at the beginning of his career as a strength athlete. And he's like, you think I can squat 600 someday? I'm like, I hope you don't. (laughs) Right. And he's like, what? I'm like, because if you're going to squat 600, you had to let a lot of other things that could have been important and gratifying in your life go by the wayside. Yep. Like a 600 pound squat is pretty serious. Uh, yeah. You know, it's not a 900 pound squat. I mean, everybody would say, oh, well, 900 is pretty crazy. I mean, 600, if you're not a kind of a squat specialist. Sure. There are some people who are genetically gifted enough. Yes. I will never be able to squat 600 again. There is zero chance from the time you were born, from the time God set your path and eternity passed, that you would ever be able to squat 600 pounds. It was not going to happen, right? That's a Calvinist joke. It's not clear to me that I will ever squat five. Although I might, it's not clear. Sure. Well, at 17, you're not entirely sure with this kid. Right. That's the only thing, right? I know one thing. He has the build of a generalist. Pena does not, right? Ray Ray does not. That's right. Tim Roberts does not. That's right. So this guy, we know, I mean, I think he's going to be really damn strong, but he's got the build of a generalist. For the vast, 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 99.99% of our listeners, they are in that middle of that bell curve. Yeah. They have to pursue getting stronger all the time. And a 600 pound squat is not, by the way, the other part of that 600 pound squat for that kid, this is something that I've come to with my businesses as well. I think these business books and these life self-improvement books and things like that want you to set two year and five year goals. I think two year and five year goal. I think goals that are that it's just bullshit. Yeah, I do too. doesn't work, man. I think the longest term goal that you could possibly have, like maybe you've got a dream out there. I'd like to build a million dollar business or I'm like, okay, that's fine. But like an actual practical goal, the longest you could ever do is a year. And most of the time we're looking at quarters. We're looking at like, okay, what can we do this month to make next month better? And then next month to make the next month better. And then we kind of look at quarters as well. So what are we going to do in quarter number two at the business to improve on quarter number one? So this kid saying like, can I squat 600? And you said, what's the squat right now? Like 375? Did you say? Yeah. For five. Well, let's squat 405. Right. 405 is a better goal. And then when he squats 405, then you go, okay, let's squat 450 or 425 or 455. Or you pick that spot that's actually within reach. 600 is not within reach, right? And that's key to everything. Hey, man, it's key to moving. I just moved to this house. Moving's a big job. If we had a list of every single thing that had to be done in this house over the next several weeks, it would be overwhelming to the point. So what we've done every day since we moved to this house, I've been in the house about four days, five days, somewhere in there is we sit down at the kitchen table, at the dining room table, and we say, what three things are we getting done today? What are the three things that matter? And we do those three things. And we get up the next morning and say, okay, what are the three things we're doing today? That's what goals should look like. If your squat is 375, the goal is 380 or 405 or something attainable that's more than you've got right now. It's not, can I be a 600-pound squatter? Sure, man, have that pipe dream. That's okay. 
Right. But like you can't map out a plan for that kid to have a 600 pound squat right now. You couldn't put together a two year programming plan to do it because you have no idea what the kid's going to deal with. He's going to get in a car accident in six months. Yeah. You know, and you don't know. Businesses like that too. And you look at someone who has made, I don't know, let's say they're a billionaire. Yeah. Like, man, they've had to let a lot of shit go by the side. Oh, of course. They had to sacrifice a lot of life to do that. So, you know, how strong is strong enough? If you're a very young person and very, very gifted, you know, that might be a question where you might actually have to say, you know what? If I go for that 750 deadlift, I'm putting myself at risk for injury that I shouldn't need. I shouldn't put myself at risk of. And I have to sacrifice too much in my regular life to do that. And I'm not going to do that anymore. By the way, what you're saying, I agree with, but I think it's completely unbelievable. I think that for 19 year old kids, if you want to pursue the most strength you possibly can and the frontal lobe, right? It's not developed. These are the guys that drive 130 miles an hour on the highway sometimes to see how fast their car will go. Do it. The real question is for the 40 year old guy who's squatting 400 pounds, the you, mm -hmm. it would be dumb for you to say, I'm going to try to deadlift 700. And by the way, you actually have the build that if you sacrificed everything in your life and you took every drug you could possibly take, you could actually possibly deadlift 700 pounds mm -hmm. because you're built to deadlift. Right. But a guy like you at 44 years old with a family and a life and things that matter more than that, you are not going to jeopardize your future by sacrificing all of those things, by taking all of those drugs, by doing all those things in order to get a 700. So, so that to me is more reality. The 19 year old kid, go for it, man. It's vanishingly small. I shouldn't even mention it probably, but there's somebody who's 32 <laughs> who can look at, you know, some of these big numbers and it's like, well, you know, listen, there's a whole bunch of things you could do in your life. And, you know, that's right. A whole bunch of those are going to get foreclosed on if you make some of these your goals. Like, by the way, let me come from the high competitive lifter side. So like when I was running strong, I won't even talk about me. I'll talk about guys that I actually saw. The thing with me, man, is I was wired to try to build business and do those things. So I kind of had that thing that could fill that hole. And I coached and coaching started to fill that hole for me. So I got to the point where I enjoyed coaching more. So I'm not a great example there, but there are guys that I won't use their names, but guys that were as much as you could be a professional power lifter, they were professional power. Lifters. Their whole life mm -hmm. was power lifting. Some of them very well known, especially at the time in the kind of mid 2000s. I'm talking about they were in full gear. They were 1100 pound squatters. They were 800 pound deadlifters, right? And those guys did that. And here's what I noticed about those guys. They got to that point and training was not fun. They approached it like a guy that worked in the coal mill approached his job. He got up every day. I guarantee you they woke up every day. Everything hurt. And they screamed a bunch of expletives and they said, I got to go squat. And they got their bag and they went to the gym and they went and squatted and they hated every second of it. It wasn't fun. They weren't cutting up. They weren't joking in the gym. And then here's what I noticed. When they would put together a good meet, and they would hit a big PR, I'm talking about like a 2,600 total PR, they would vanish for the next two years. Because to do that, even for a guy who, and again, I'm not specifically calling out any one person, but let's say a guy who has a average IQ to below average IQ, was never going to be able to run big business, was never going to be able to do other like great things in the world. This was kind of the way they were going to be able to make their mark. Even they had to sacrifice so much that when they finally got that, they just couldn't turn around and go right back into the next training cycle to try to do it again. They often would put together PR powerlifting meets once every couple of years. And in the first year after their big PRs, they often wouldn't train at all. Or they would go screw around and CrossFit and lose a bunch of weight. They go from like 330 and they get down to 230. And then they like kind of get the itch again and here we go and they'd ramp up the drugs and they'd ramp up the food and they'd ramp up the training and then two years after their last PR they would go and try to pursue PRs again I mean that's what it takes and so you know even those guys recognize that there's a massive sacrifice and they often aren't willing to do that for the long term yeah you can go watch I think it's on Netflix the documentary Eddie Hall on a strong man mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you can just see how much that man sacrificed you're talking about humanity. That guy, his humanity shine. That's why that movie's so good. You and I were, you know, we got all choked up watching the thing. Yeah. And then in the movie, he hadn't become the world's strongest man yet. And then he wins the world's strongest man the next year. And? And he quit. And he retires. 
And he should have. And he should have. He had sacrificed so much. I don't know if he's still married. I think he's still married. I keep up with him on Instagram. He's lean. He's got abs. You know, and remember that guy was a international level competitive swimmer. Like he was on Britain's swim team, the international swim team. The guy was a sprint swimmer. So, I mean, he was a real good athlete, but he didn't have the frame to be the world. So he's not Brian Shaw. He's not Thor. He's under six feet, right? Brian Shaw and Thor. And of course, Brian Shaw is starting to break down now. Brian Shaw's peaked, right? Thor's another one of those guys. He's still probably up and coming. Thor's probably got another two years because he's just so big and built that way. But Eddie Hall wasn't. Eddie Hall was a lot smaller than the rest of those guys. So it took everything he had, literally everything he had to completely sacrifice everything to win the world's strongest man. And then when he did, he's like, all right, what else are you going to pursue at that point? Nobody wants to talk about it. These guys don't live very long. They don't. They don't live very long. Especially strong men because they're so big. It almost doesn't matter us talking about this because very, very few people at any given time, there's what, maybe 600 people on the globe that need to make that decision. I don't know. I'm not very many. Yeah, but I think you can extrapolate out the same decisions. The point is, is that even for the guys at that far right end of the strength spectrum that has more potential than anybody who's listening to this show, even they at some point have setbacks, get sick, die, decide there's too much sacrifice to make to pursue it at all costs. We're not asking our people to do that. We, don't, we wouldn't want that. That's when your kid who's 17 says, can I squat 600? And you say, I hope you don't. That's what you mean. Yeah. But for most of you out there, you are going to continue to pursue a reachable strength goal. That's what training is. You'll say like, this is where I'm at. Not this is where I want to be in five years, but this is where I want to be next month. And you'll train to do that. My poor wife, she's stronger than she has ever been right now. By not even close. Like she's so strong right now. Yeah. But even she, she's going to make some of these decisions. And here's how she's done that. She's placed constraints on herself. Like she's still a mom. She's still married to me. You know, she still has work that she needs to do. She is not willing to go up a weight class. You know, she's hampered herself. You know, she's sure, not pursuing strength. She ain't taking drugs. She's not pursuing strength as the be all end all. And so she's working within some confines that she's put on herself, you know, and it's hard. She could be stronger if she weighed more. She could be stronger if she took some stuff. She could be stronger if, well, a number of things could happen. Yeah, if she quit being motherly, if she quit working, if she, like you know, any of those things. Yeah. That's right. And she's not willing to do that because she wants to have some balance. And, uh, and so it's a struggle, but that's okay. That's okay. Now, before we wrap up the show, we need to go to the opposite ass end of the spectrum. There are far more of you listening to this show right now who are 165 pound men who squat 185 and you think you're strong enough and you're not. Or squatting 285. That ain't strong enough either, really. That's exactly right. You are not strong enough. And so if you have to ask that question and you are not at the top of the game, if you are not in the competitive realm to the point that you're winning meets consistently, you don't even have to ask this question. How strong is strong enough? The answer is, it's that Jillian Ward stuff. You got to get a little stronger tomorrow than you were today. And then tomorrow, you got to get a little stronger than the next day, right? And so that's the goal. And so if you're one of these guys, it's like, well, I've gone through LP and you've actually no shit gone through LP. You've done a pretty good job of eating all your groceries and you've put on solid weight and you're the strongest you've ever been and the healthiest you've ever been. It's exactly where you are right now, actually, right? So you're strong and you're healthy. You're not over fat, right? You're starting to cut a little bit of, uh, waist again, that you look good, you are strong. Is your goal now to maintain or to start pulling weight off the bar? Like, no, your goal is to hit some PRs now. That's the goal. I like what you said. If you're not somebody who consistently wins meets, you don't have to ask this question because life will tell you. Life will tell you that you ain't. And it'll tell you when you get a fever. It'll tell you when you get a sinus infection. It'll tell you when you break a bone. It'll tell you when you get on vacation. It'll tell you when you get cancer. And then you just get back in the gym and do your best. And then I want to say another word there about the myth of maintenance. You just really can't do it. You can work up and get strong, and then you can focus on something else and detrain, and then work up and get strong again, and then focus on something else and detrain. There is no maintenance. Right. You don't squat 315 three times a week and just keep it. You can't. And I wish you could. Because I'll tell you what, man, Matt, I don't like what squatting worth a no. And if I could squat, you know, 350 for three sets of five forever and stay there, I would. There is no question about it. Sure. But I can't. By the way, that person that goes back and forth that kind of like hops from one thing to another thing. It's all right. There is actually a time that I think that that's okay. 
but I yeah. only think that that's okay. The question to answer is, am I strong enough for anything that life can throw at me? Right. So you got a guy, you know, like Eddie Keene, great guy, and he's super into rucking right now. He rucks, does these long ass rucks. And the guy's gotten really strong in the last several years. Actually, Charity's coached him for years. He's gotten really strong, but he knows that the rucking he does now takes away from his strength. It has to, right? You can't put on a whatever the 50 pound backpack and hike 25 miles and not have that affect your squat. It does. But the guy's already has pursued a significant amount of strength. He's put on what, 40, 50 pounds of muscle. That's a guy who's, what's that, he's 50 years old? He's 49, 50 years old, something like that. And so he's at a point where if he wants to do some seasons of his life where he wants to focus on rucking and his strength is going to come down a little bit, he's going to detrain. And it's like, okay, now like it's winter time. The guy lives in Vegas. There isn't any winter time, but you know, it's whatever that is. And you decide like, all right, now I'm going to focus on strength. I actually don't have any problems with that. That's why I asked Brett. If when they're detrained, they're still strong enough for anything life throws at them. Okay. Yeah. That's a good way to say it. The problem that we get is we get a lot of hoppers who kind of half-ass go through LP and then they decide to go put all their eggs in the CrossFit basket. And then a year later after CrossFit, they decide to put all their eggs in the hot yoga basket. And then you know, like that's, you know, and then they're going to go do mud runs and they're gonna, like, that's a problem, right? That's what I call my underwear, the hot yoga basket. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> so bad. There's another Barbell Logic podcast, guys. Share this with your training buddy. Send him a link to this podcast or your wife or your husband. And let's help spread the word, man. We need more people to get strong so that more people can handle whatever life throws at them and more people can uh, ford the river and uh, swim behind that horse and go capture the bad guys. We need more of that. Thanks for listening, guys.